Joe Herb and I'd like to talk about the new Thor from Marvel Comics. When I heard this was coming out, I felt I had to say something. Uh, first and foremost, I hope I don't offend anyone. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to state an opinion here. Second of all, I'd like to point out that I'll be using drawings from certain comic books to support my opinions. Now these drawings were commissioned, copyrighted, and owned by Marvel Comics. Only five drawings are my own. The rest belongs to them. I just wanted to use them to talk about my opinions on the new character being named Thor. And my opinion is, I don't know if it'll work. And I have two major problems with it. Now before we get started, there's a couple of things I'd like to point out. First of all, I will not be concentrating on actual mythology very much. Only comic book mythology. That's what I really want to focus on. Second, I also want to talk about the good points of having a new wielder of Mjolnir out there. The fact that there's a new Thor is really exciting because it opens up a lot of opportunity for character development. And I'm not talking about the new Thor, not just for her. No, also with the original Thor, the actual Thor. So Marvel, I really hope you're listening. Okay, the first reason I have that this new character calling herself Thor may not work out so well is that it's been done before. During the late 80s and early 90s, Thor was off-world and couldn't protect Earth. So a man named Eric Masterson was deemed worthy to wield Mjolnir and was chosen to protect Earth while Thor was away. The character was seemingly an exact copy of Thor. Eric had the clothes, the helmet, the cape, even the accent for a short time. Most importantly, the writers gave Eric Masterson's Thor's name. Now I understand it up to a point. I mean, Thor was gone and you can't let people know your big gun is missing, so... You have someone replace him, right? But after a while, I got kind of tired of it. I mean, where was the originality? And now Marvel's doing it again. Only this time it's with a woman. Having all the same things that Thor has, just like Eric did. She even has a mask like Eric Masterson. Although I have to admit, having a mask does make sense up to a point. I mean, I hear Marvel's trying to keep this character's identity a secret. Even from Odin. But that part makes no sense. I mean, how could Odin not know? How is that going to work? You know, in comic book mythology, not actual mythology, Odin was the one to have Mjolnir forged. For himself. I mean, not only did he fill it with other types of magic, but he also filled it with the Odin force. His own life force. So ultimately, in the end, that hammer obeys only him. I mean, with a snap of his fingers or a word, that hammer will fly straight to his hand and the identity will be revealed. So, that part shouldn't change. I mean, how are they going to keep that secret from Odin? But I digress. This uh, new Thor is nothing more than a copy-paste idea. And copy-paste ideas are generally unsuccessful. There's no originality, and the fact that she's a woman it doesn't make the copy-paste idea more interesting. Especially if they're using that blonde blue eyes trait again. I mean, that shows no attempt at originality there. Almost every character that Marvel's had that's been worthy of the power of Thor has been blonde and blue eyed. Even that character from the future, or that other one from the What If comics. Ooh, look familiar? Now the second reason I have is that this character has no real identity of her own. At least not yet. You see, Thor is not a superhero code name like Superman, and it's not a title to be passed down like Captain America. It's an actual name of birth, one that's being used. You see, when Eric Masterson was posing as Thor, the original Thor was nowhere to be found. He wasn't even on Earth, so I can understand up to a point why Marvel did it then. But it didn't seem to do very well. Thor was still alive and still showing up in comics. I could only assume that customers were wondering when the real Thor would return. Now don't get me wrong, the idea that other people besides Thor are worthy of Mjolnir is a great idea, especially if they're human. You see, a human being worthy of the power of Thor it adds more than just simply depth to the story. It adds hope. Hope that human beings are more than what they seem to be. But if you want that character to last, you have to give them an identity of their own, not leech off of someone else. If you want this character to last, she has to be unique from Thor. Not a copy of Thor. Take a look at Beta Ray Bill. Beta Ray Bill has 
has lasted from the 1980s to today, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason people still want him around. He is unique from Thor. He is Thor's equal in almost every way, but he is completely unique from him, not a copy. Beta Ray Bill was actually an android with the soul of an alien being, a being called a Corbinite. He was built to protect his people from demons, and he actually thought Thor was one. He beat Thor up and took his hammer. He actually took Mjolnir from him. And not only was Bill worthy of Mjolnir, he beat Thor for it. Twice! In the end, it was Beta Ray Bill who refused to take the hammer from Thor because Thor was too noble a warrior to take from. He saw in Thor a kindred spirit, not someone to emulate or to be like, but more like a blood brother. So in return, Odin created a new hammer for Beta Ray Bill, the only weapon equal to Mjolnir, Stormbreaker. This is why Beta Ray Bill has lasted this long, why he has such a strong fan base. He's just as noble and as heroic as Thor ever was, but he's completely different from him. He has his own history, his own hammer, his own name. He's even had his own look from time to time. He is Thor's equal, not his copy. Even Eric Masterson was given his own identity for a short time. They called him Thunderstrike. He had his own weapon, which was a mace. He had his own look. It wasn't a good look, but it was still his own look. And he had his own name. His powers were also unique from Thor, you know. With that mace, he wasn't as powerful as he was when he wielded Mjolnir. But they were still his own powers. Just like Beta Ray Bill, Thunderstrike was unique from Thor. And because of that, he lasted for a pretty long time in Marvel Comics. They ended up killing the poor guy, but they resurrected him for a short time. They brought the character back to life for a couple of issues in Avengers. And even had a series where his son took over his Thunderstrike. I think he's still around. Kind of funny what you think about it. Thunderstrike lasted longer than Eric Masterson, or even Eric Masterson is Thor. Is there any reason this new character can't be unique from Thor like Beta Ray Bill or Thunderstrike? I mean, I have so many questions. I mean, will she sound like him? Will she act like him? I, I, I honestly hope not. You know, if this character is to last, she's got to be unique. I mean, she's got to have her own style, her own dialogue, her own history. Even the way she wields the hammer has got to be different. This is what this new character needs. She needs her own identity, her own name. A name that's equal to, but different from Thor. You know, nothing stupid like Bolt Babe or Lightning Glass. I mean, a name that actually means something. It would also be great if it were a brand new character. Not an old one in disguise. You know, someone completely new. The idea of a woman wielding Mjolnir is a great idea. I mean, to be honest, I really never saw that coming. I just don't think she should be named Thor. It's a copy and paste idea. And on top of that, the original Thor is still around. So why would you call this new one Thor and risk confusing the reader? It just seems like it's going to cause more problems than solutions, that's all. Now that being said, there are some major good points about introducing this new Thunder God. Let's start with the original Thor. Now that someone else is wielding Mjolnir, this is a perfect opportunity to further mature Thor's character and abilities without the hammer. In Marvel Comics, it was always rare to see Thor without Mjolnir. But when that would happen, sometimes the writer would have Thor reveal some type of untapped potential, almost as if the hammer was holding him back. What I've heard is that Marvel intends to make Thor weaker without the hammer. And that's a mistake. He's never been weaker without Mjolnir before, so why are they starting now? Mjolnir only gave him abilities that he couldn't do by himself. The hammer gave him the ability of flight, teleportation, even time travel. But it never made him tougher. I mean, it never made him faster or stronger. That he already had. I mean, with or without that hammer, Thor should be able to trade blows with the Hulk and come out with one piece. He can even summon thunder and lightning without Mjolnir. I don't think making Thor weaker without Mjolnir is a very good idea. A better idea would be to show Mjolnir as more or less of a crutch for Thor. And now that it's gone, 
you could start showing an entirely different side of him. How about the power he inherited from his bloodline, for example? You know, his lineage. And I'm not talking about just from Odin, no, not just from his father. I'm also talking about from his mother, Gia. In actual mythology, Thor was the son of Odin and Jord. Jord is the Norwegian name for Earth, in case people didn't know that. Marvel Comics, however, has decided to use the name Gia from Greek mythology. Now, Gia, or Jord, if you prefer, is not some simple Earth goddess like Marvel Comics is trying to make her out to be in current stories. She is the Earth. You know, she's the planet. She was the one who helped give birth to the Titans and the gods that helped give life to the entire universe. She's basically a cosmic force. In the Marvel comic story Chaos War, Earth was the very first thing to be born from the Chaos King itself, from the very being who was basically the void of the entire universe. Before all life existed, there was the Chaos King, and then there was Earth. It's kind of like uh, Marvel's version of Blackest Night. This is why the Chaos King was saving her for last. In the story, The Chaos War, he was devouring everything in the universe, but he was saving Gia for last. You know why? Because she was the first thing to be born from him. Now, I don't really count Galactus as being the oldest being in their universe because he wasn't really born there. He survived the death of one universe only to end up in another. Gia was the first one to be born in that universe, so she's technically the oldest living thing in the Marvel Universe, or is supposed to be. Gia represents a power that basically gave life to the entire Marvel multiverse. In every universe, there are titans and there are gods, and there's also an Earth that gave them life. Writers, if you're out there listening, imagine a character so important that the living universe itself takes physical form and uses her to create powerful beings that are strong enough to seed the entire universe with sentient life. Imagine a character powerful enough to create those types of beings, to be actually able to give them life. Now imagine being related to it. And I'm not talking about uh, being a descendant or, or you know, like being created like human beings were. I'm talking about having a direct, first-generation bloodline link to it. That's what Thor is. That is what Thor is in actual mythology, and that is what Thor is in comic book mythology. Now... Can you really see that type of a character being weakened without a hammer? I mean, even if that hammer is Mjolnir, it doesn't make the character, it's just simply part of the character, and this is a perfect opportunity to show that. Now, I was just talking about Thor's mother. Let's start talking about his father, Odin. In Marvel Comics, Odin is one of the primordial beings of the universe. See, Gia gave life to Bor, which is Odin's father, and then Bor gave life to Kull and Odin. See, Odin's like one of the top three, four elder gods out there. Now in exile, Odin was once a lord of gods. I mean, this guy is so strong, his energy can take on a life and form of its own. That's what the Odin Force is. It's actually sentient energy. Aside from having the Odin Force, Odin has mastered countless different forms of energy, be they mystical or scientific in nature. He's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe and beaten demon lords, dark gods, even evil conquerors like Thanos or Galactus. He's even beaten Mephisto. At one time, Odin even killed and then revived Hela. You know who Hela is, right? She's the queen of the underworld, the Vikings' version of death itself. Now, if you're strong enough to kill and then revive one of the personifications of death itself, you are not to be screwed with. These are Thor's parents. This is what he's inherited. Can you explain to me how someone who's inherited that much from such powerful beings is going to be weakened without a hammer? Yeah. Mjolnir is one of the most unique and one of the most powerful weapons in the Marvel Universe, but it didn't make Thor who he was. I mean, it didn't make him stronger or faster and it didn't alter his personality either. All that stuff he already possessed. And the only reason he was able to lift the hammer is because he was noble enough to do so. So, how is he going to be weaker without it? 
How is he going to be less noble or less powerful? If anything, Marvel should be showing how far Thor can go without the hammer. As I've said before, Thor has been without Mjolnir many times, and there have been rare stories where they start showing his potential. This is an opportunity to get back into that, to show just how powerful Thor is when he doesn't need to depend on Mjolnir too much. To show that in the end, Mjolnir was just a crutch. Now the only reason I'm saying this is because it looks like Marvel wants to start shaking things up. Now Marvel, if you want to start shaking things up, the best way to do that is to show that Thor is more than just his fists. There were stories in the past where Thor had gained wisdom, and when that happened, not only was he embraced by the Odin Force, but he also learned the magic of the Rune Stones. You could start bringing that back, you know, piece by piece. Now I can see why Thor can't have the Odin Force anymore because, well, Odin's alive. But that shouldn't mean he can no longer use the power of the Rune Stones. That he learned when he gained wisdom. And wisdom is not a superpower. It's not a magic power. It's actual power. One that you earn. And that doesn't go away. Now, with that type of wisdom at his disposal, Thor should be tapping into different types of energy of his own, forging his own weapons. Wisdom is training, knowledge, and experience combined. And this is something Thor should have a lot of by now. Don't miss this opportunity, Marvel. If Thor can no longer wield Njolnir, you need to compensate for the loss. And the compensation should be complex enough to show actual growth in the character. Now Marvel, if you're worried you're going to make the character too powerful, the best way to offset that is to give Thor new and more interesting characters to fight. A perfect example? Gore the God Butcher. Now I don't know who created this character, be it Jason Aaron, Marvel, or a combination of both. All I know is that whoever did, bravo. This character was not only capable of killing Thor, he was capable of even humiliating him before killing him. Now that's something that's pretty rare, showing just how vulnerable a character as powerful as Thor can actually be. And this is what makes the character interesting. Not simply the possibility of defeat, mind you, but also learning from that defeat, becoming stronger because of it, be it physically, like learning a new ability, or perhaps even mentally and emotionally, such as learning humility, and using it to strengthen his will for the next battle. Ever since Jason Aaron's been writing the story, this is something that I've seen more than once, where Thor has suffered defeat. And I'm not talking about simply losing a fight. No, I'm talking about where he lost the war, where he failed in his mission. Even some of Thor's comrades were killed in these stories. And this is something that I find very, very impressive because it shows that even characters at Thor's level are vulnerable to things like doubt and fear, even death. This will give Thor's character room to grow. And in doing so, you'll be able to separate himself from the new Thor enabling the writers to be able to give this new Thor her own personality, her own history, you know, making her an individual instead of a carbon copy. Yeah, I can see a lot of opportunities popping up because Thor no longer has the hammer. This is a really good chance to give the character some more depth, some new type of ability. This way, you can make the character unique from the new wielder of Mjolnir. That way, if you decide to keep both characters as Thor, they'll still be separate, not copies of each other. Another good point about having a new Thunder God in town is that it gives Marvel the chance to develop one of the most, at least what I think to be one of the most unique and one of the most complex characters in the Thor franchise. And that is Mjolnir itself. Hands down, Mjolnir is one of the most powerful weapons in the Marvel Universe. Summoning forth thunder and lightning is the least Mjolnir can do. I mean, bottom of the barrel least. It has the Odin Force, it has Anti-Force Energy, which is the power to destroy entire worlds, the God Blast, which is potentially stronger than that. I mean, this hammer has got so many abilities, I can't name them all this time. It would take too long. But let's talk about the Odin Force for now. 
Remember, the Odin force is so powerful it can take on a life of its own. It's sentient energy. And some of that power resides within Mjolnir. It resides within the hammer. Think about it. Whenever Thor calls Mjolnir, it comes to him. Thor speaks to the hammer. And Mjolnir will not allow anyone who is unworthy to lift it. Except in space, which doesn't really make much sense to me. I mean, I know without gravity you should be able to lift it, but we're talking about divine energy here. Which should trump science, but, you know, that's up to the writer, I guess. Back to the matter at hand. You know, there are scenes in certain comic books where Mjolnir is actually responding to Thor when he speaks to it. I mean, not talking to Thor, of course, but it actually does respond in some way. It all fits. Divine energy. Thor speaks to the hammer, and the hammer responds. It also will not allow anyone who is unworthy to lift it. That tells me one thing. Mjolnir is alive. There's a lot you can do with that type of concept, with that type of idea. Let's think about this. I mean, people with similar qualities to the original Thor are worthy to lift Mjolnir, but each person is different. I mean, you could say because of the Odin Force, the energies that come forth from the hammer would be a bit different as well. Instead of simple flight for the new wielder, you could add the ability to levitate other objects into the air, like giant boulders. Instead of the anti-force energy, perhaps you could summon a different type of energy altogether, like uh, a different type of fire. It could be a different color. Each person is unique, right? That means the power that comes forth from Mjolnir should be unique as well, or at least a little bit. Especially if Mjolnir is alive, it should respond differently to each wielder. If you are looking to shake things up, Marvel Comics, I hope you consider these options. Mature the actual Thor beyond his current level. Give him some greater wisdom or some greater abilities to compensate for the loss of the hammer. Show that Mjolnir has different abilities beyond simple thunder and lightning. It can do way more than that. Start showing it. And please, please, give this new wielder of Mjolnir her own identity. The fact that a woman is wielding it is really interesting to me, and I want to see it last. So make her Thor's equal, not his copy.